Thank you, Raj. Uh, really happy to uh, be talking to you guys today at uh, Product Elevation. Thank you for having me to Dave and the team, uh, a great event organized. Um, my talk today is about small business thinking, behaviors and attitudes in a big business environment. So, you know, when we go through this today, the way it's going to happen is I want you to play a little bit of make-believe with me. I want to uh, go on a little journey and a little bit of let's pretend involved. Um, so bear with me as we, as we, as we go into that. Um, as we go along, uh, I have the, the chat open and any questions that you have, I'm very happy to be interrupted. I'll keep an eye out and uh, by all means, throw any questions you have as we go uh, into the chat. A little bit about me uh, before we jump in um, and my background and kind of how I came across this was a few years ago, myself and some buddies had a startup. Uh, we built a, a golf platform, um, mainly in the States and uh, really had a, a first experience of designing a product from scratch um, with no design team and, you know, a, a scratch team of engineers and, and a few people outsourced and favors and shoestring budgets. And uh, it was really, it was a really interesting experience. Um, we sold the company a couple of years later and really this is kind of how it sits into my, my CV. Um, I started out in, in Vodafone and Bank of Ireland, big, big companies, uh, a lot of kind of corporate, process driven expertise, household names kind of kind of stuff. Um, did the startup in Vox Golf and then joined Finergo, which is Ireland's most recent unicorn, um, billion dollar status quite recently. Uh, really scaling, you know, startup with, with big ambition. Um, currently my job in Workday, I run a team of 10 product managers um, and back into that big corporate environment. And I guess what I took from that journey is that the, the big companies with the green ticks think and act and behave differently from the, from the small businesses, which is a pretty obvious statement, right? But I thought it was something that struck me that, you know, there are some behaviors, attitudes, and, and ways of doing things in those smaller companies that play really well um, with, you know, doing business in big global corporate environments. Like just because you're in one of those shiny multinationals does not mean that you can apply some of that entrepreneurial thinking that happens in startups and, and small businesses. So in terms of a little bit of make-believe, I, like I think of this as my team, right? And what I want you to do is think of this as your team as we go through here. Um, and I want you to imagine, you know, like what if your team, the team that you're in right now and everybody does the same job, but what if your team was a startup? So, you know, in my case, we're a group of product managers and we, we supply a service effectively to a big technology org and work day. Um, and what if we spun out tomorrow, right? What if we left Workday and sold our services back to Workday as a customer? You know, if you're on an engineering team, if you're on a scrum team, um, if you've got five or six devs, if you've got a dev manager, a couple of QAs, a product manager, agile coach, like what if what if you guys literally just took that out and became your own startup, sold your services back to your current company and or to other companies? What would that look like? And so what I'm going to do for our talk is step you through a few things that will be different if your team was a startup. And straight away, the first one um, is that instead of colleagues, you'd have customers, right? So you know, internally in, 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 the, in the big companies, we tend to work for our, our colleagues, particularly in technology orgs. You know, sure, we have end customers, but if you're a product manager, if you're an engineer, there are a couple of jumps away from where you are if you think of the sales process and the, the, the product process, the engineering process. So really, if you're to take, say, for example, a product manager in a scrum team, the customer of your work is, is the person who's taking those refined features that, that prioritize backlog that roadmap and consuming that and, and, and taking it on to do their job. So if you if you had customers, if your team was a startup, would your customers be happy? And, and how would you know if they were happy? And if you had if you were a startup, that that small group of customers being a, a new company, you're gonna have a small group, are very powerful. So you know people think of freedom when they think of startups, but in truth, if you've got two or three customers, they tend to have 30, 40% of your revenue line. Um, immediately and you know you can be innovative and you can be forward thinking and you can design your product 
But if they want something and they're a big chunk of your business, they're going to get it, right? So it's an interesting dynamic to consider. And as we go through each of these questions, each of these what if scenarios, in blue at the bottom, what I'm going to do is give you a tangible and specific and practical example of how I apply this to my team and, and you know, in, in the real world. So yeah, it's make believe, but you know, we took this this uh, on board recently where you know we serve a an engineering group of about 80 people all told um, as a group of eight product managers. Um, and they're our customers. So we surveyed them. You know, we 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 set up a, a simple Google form, asked them a few questions about are we doing a good job, what are we doing well, what, what we could do better. We looked at where some product managers were doing things really well over there, but we're not doing that same practice over here. So we shared best practice across the way. So we ran that survey quite recently, actually, and then I separately contacted all of the managers, all the dev managers. And I sat down with them and, and chatted with them and just took manager level feedback about what's going well, what's what's not going so well. We put it all together. So treating you know our internal customers like a startup to treat its customers, almost like having an MBS score for yourselves, is a good example of small business thinking in, in the big business environment. Um, Instead of VPs or big bosses, you'd have investors, right? If you were a startup, you would have your own money put in, most likely. Um, you'd all have a chunk of equity, most likely. Um, and you know that investor-entrepreneur relationship is a really interesting one. They have a habit of asking really easy questions that are very difficult to answer. Um, so you know if you're talking about any kind of, of innovation or, or growing your business in any way, or should we do should we do this or that? And you've got to go and look for more money. Investors just want to know what the return on that investment is and when it's coming. Um, you know, there's challenging you can, you know challenging questions that come from that relationship. And if we apply that in the real world to to what we do, decision making in in big business really would benefit from having more of that entrepreneur investor relationship where. It's not, you know, we have a boss who's the decision maker and the rest of us just execute on their plan. Like if you think about it as product teams, as engineering teams, you know, rarely if ever does a diktat come down that this is the plan and this is exactly what we're going to do. The vast majority of the time, our leaders, our VPs, our directors are sure they might be setting a vision, but in terms of the ideas to execute on that vision are coming from the teams themselves from product managers who are clued into their industry, from engineers who kind of have innovative, who see what the next generation of their platform or product is. And so where you've got those ideas, you need funding for them. So bring them to the table and have an investor, have a little bit of that dragon's den feel to your decision-making is no harm at all. Um, commercial awareness is a really interesting one. Um, abundantly apparent in a startup or in a small business where everybody from the person who sweeps the floor to the person who writes the code to the person who manages the products sometimes are all the same person um very commercially aware even the people that don't consider themselves financial or commercial or business like really know the dollars and cents of the business we all know a lot of us know what it's like to be in a very big company and it's just not apparent right the 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 streets can be paved with gold when your company is going very well. Um, it's easy to get new investments. Um, you know the, the the basics of you know what I would say: buy for a dollar, sell for two. Um, you know is can be a little bit lost. That's from the drug dealers in the wire. That 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 phrase, and it just stuck with me. Like there's that's something that you know people, fictitious people in that case, but people who would have you know no real education. Um, they're definitely not going around with masters in management or, 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 or computer science degrees, but they've got that common sense attitude to business of, you know, you, we're, 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 we're spending this and we're selling it for that. And, you know, it's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta have an upside. It's gotta have a profit. And so sometimes, you know, what, what we do in our org with, with investment mapping, investment mapping, and it's tough to do, right. But really just allocate resources on the basis of your strategy or your plan. And, sometimes you've got to do this retrospectively to really show where the money is going because people build up teams and areas and, and, and roadmaps for all sorts of reasons and it's not always really commercially driven so even the best businesses need to reflect on that sometimes saying hold on a second how much are we spending here and where is that money going even if we have a really good plan 
Um, if we were a startup, we'd have a brand, right? So like, think of this from my own team's perspective. Um, we are, you know, a group of product people in, in Workday. So our brand is Workday. Our brand is not Workday, right? So, and especially if we were a startup, our brand would be our team, our spin out product group. And so people think about cons customer facing brands, but it's less relevant here. What I'm talking about is, you know, even internally, um, or externally, I hire all the time. You know, we, we, we grow, we grow, people move on. You're always looking for people, um, it seems the whole time. And so, you know, how do you manage that perception, right? Like you're, whether you like it or not, your team has a perception internally and your startup would have a perception in the industry or when you're hiring people. Um, and, you know, do you want it to have a good perception or a bad perception? How, how do you manage that? So like in practical terms, for example, like, you know, I do conferences like this. I do talks like this where I can elsewhere and work day to people who are, you know, we don't necessarily do business with, but they have product managers. I have product managers. They might want to join our team. We might want to join their team. It's good to have that kind of manage that perception of your group. If you're a scrum team, do you have a brand that's high performers that deliver on time or is your brand the guys who always miss the target or who are always late or are we always, always you know overestimate and under deliver um that's a that's an that's an important thing that all businesses standalone businesses have to do but you can take that thinking into managing your own team and way of working even if it's in a very big company um my old ceo in in in, in Finergo had a great phrase uh swiss army knife uh so you know in big business, we tend to have an expert for everything, right? We want to do some testing, we've got a test person. We want to do some design, we've got a design person. We want to do some research, we've got a research person. Every single thing has a, a specialist, someone who's employed and who's bread and butter and day job is to do that thing. That's not the case when there's five or six of you in a room running a small business. You've got to be a Swiss Army knife. You've got to be able to turn your hand to a variety of different tasks and roles. And while, okay, in, in big business, we don't necessarily need to do that in, in, a, in a big scale, but it really helps when, you know, you're able to kind of step up outside of your, your core role and do a little bit more, if not, if not a lot more. And think of this, you know, I've got internal mobility of roles written down there. So, you know, we've, we've done some reorganization of our team recently and really helps when you're moving people from there to there, if they show that kind of dexterity, that, that, flexibility of, of, of not just staying in their lane and even take that you know a, a, a line further um like if some of you are product managers and you're thinking about your career um that's a good personal brand thing to have to be someone who's very adaptable um who's got a little bit of skill in different areas as a, that versatile experience and sometimes you might need to actually build that into your career path where you literally go and do some different roles along the way um rather than a straight through career path but you know, role flexibility is something that's very apparent when in a small business, but also very useful in a big business. Um, this is a tough one. So strategy and, and, and what does success look like gets, you know, I don't want to say muddled, but it can be tough in a very big organization, right? Like, what are we, what are we going after here? And it, it kind of falls onto middle management often to kind of define what success is for our group. Um, but you know, in a, if our team was a startup, there would be no there would be no bones about that, right? We you know we might be chasing an exit, like an acquisition, for example, um, or we might be trying to grow our own multinational in our own backyard. But either way, everybody on the team is really crystal clear of the vision, often because they're incentivized to do so because they've got equity or something like that. Back to our commercial point on the right hand side there. Um, but either way, you know, having that awareness of strategies and success is, is, is really important. And it's something that we're tackling at the moment in terms of setting the vision for our organization, which is the UI platform in, uh, in Workday. But probably the most trickiest one of the lot so far uh, to, to go after in the way that a small business does. Um, it's probably my favorite one. So ambition to grow is something that we would most definitely have if, if we were a startup. So, that is, yep, yeah, sure, we do a good job. Uh, you know, everything going along as it is, fine. But we want more profit. We want more revenue. We want more people. We want to grow the size of our business. And it's not something that, you know, is 
abundantly apparent in 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 major multinationals. Um, you know, in terms of how this might practically get applied, think of things like like hackathons or you know in those innovation days, Freedom Fridays, whatever whatever you might do. Um, there are useful ways of figuring out what more can you do, like asking that that question. What more can our org do? You need a good leader for this, um, you know, to have that startup mindset of, yep, we do this today, but we could do this and that and that tomorrow. Um, and that requires investments, right? That, that requires, you know, being able to identify the gap, identify that the senior vice president has this problem. Um, you know, in a startup context, that's identifying that this investor also invests in another company in a, in a, in a partner area. But having an eye out for that and being able to, you know, deploy that skill of, of asking for investment in the right way and saying, you know, you've got a problem and we've got a solution to that problem. That, that ambition is something that you can, you can really take into a, to a corporate career or, you know, the, the multinational landscape. Um, and then lastly, and I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions if, if, if there are any after this. Um, lastly, um, if you were a startup, you'd have competitors, um, which is not something that we think a lot about as a, as a team built into a major organization. And I don't mean this so much in, 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 in the context of, you know, people competing with you, although it is a useful thought to have. So, you know, there's other teams dotted around, there's other guys who do my job who, who run a team of product managers um, and, you know, uh, how do I stack up against them, right? So I've got a buddy who who runs a team of product managers in Salesforce, and kind of similar similar ish questions, and you know, or sim similar ish roles and questions that come to him. So really, what I'm what I'm trying to do is have some tea and sympathy with him now and again, and just kind of measure up what the, the, the similar experiences that we're having, and and really kind of you know see if we can help each other. So you know, thinking of yourself as a team that that has you know, different competitors and, 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 you know, how do you measure up is a, is a useful thought to have as well as kind of building up connections externally and in, internally in your business. Um, so, uh, I see a couple of questions coming in. Um, that's my, uh, presentation start to finish. Um, I hope that was of some help to you in terms of thinking of your own, uh, your own team as a startup. Um, across the board, let me let me pick on one or two. Let me pick on one or two questions before we uh, wrap up. Hi, yeah. So the first question uh, is, you know, what is the biggest difference between a startup and a major multinational product team? You know, so mostly you have covered partially about this, but then you know you can take some more time to cover in detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So I would say in for for a product team. Uh, probably the biggest difference is the uh, the breadth of the role in in in, in a major business. Um, the breadth of the role is, is 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 it's not. I wouldn't call it narrow, but you know you've got a set amount of deliverables. You've got you know you want to be the person who sets the vision, defines the roadmap, refines the features, inbounds the team, outbounds it to to stakeholders. It's relatively quite quite defined. You don't don't have that luxury in in a startup. Um, you've got to you know you've got to meet the customers. You've got to go with the CEO to meet investors. You have to talk to the finance people. You may even have to go and meet the bank, right? About about the fi company finances. It's it's you know much much broader. Um, but you know at the same time, like I said, there's something that can be taken from that of, of having at least an understanding of those of those other areas and taking that into the, the, the narrow role in, in a big company. Yeah. And uh, probably the next question is, you know, uh, is it mandatory for product managers to have the startup experience in their career? That's an interesting one. Uh, yeah. So like, obviously definitely not mandatory, but, 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 uh, I think important, right. I, th I think that's changed in the last 10 years, maybe even five years. I, I, I guess I think of it as, um, I remember like a thousand years ago when I came out of college from doing an undergrad, you know, doing an undergrad was a good thing and, and you got a good job. And it seemed that in, in recent decades, just 
I guess just an undergrad might, might not cut it as well or, or get you to the top of the tree. So doing a master's almost straight out of college or recently out of college became an obvious choice and, and, and the bar moved on. And now I, I, I kind of think that doing the undergrad and the master's, having been in a startup or even started your own business is now that kind of next level beyond beyond again. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to have all of those three things, but it's like a badge of honor, not unlike having a having an undergrad or a master's was in, in, in decades past. So, you know, I can be honest, um, I do look for it when I'm hiring product managers. It's not a deal maker or a deal breaker. Um, but I but I do have an eye out for someone who's been like LinkedIn is a fantastic tool, right? There's yeah. you, 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 you when you don't recognize a brand on someone's CV, you click in how many people if it says 12 employees on LinkedIn, all of a sudden, my, I, I'm definitely interested. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, in fact, the next question that we have is, you know, what are the various levels of experience that the people in the startup, so startup would have started with just like four, five people, six people, whatever it is, right? Sometimes, you know, I know even startups which are one person, two person, and then, you know, slowly grown up. So until, you know, when they become bigger and bigger and bigger, when they add more people and then they start forming teams. And then, you know, when you come to a company of a size 500,000, where you even have product lines and things like that, you know, what can be, you know, the experience of the people inside and how can we ensure that this growth is maintained in a sustainable way? So when I say sustainable, you know, it should be also intact. The core startup values that you spoke about should also be intact. Maybe that is the question. Yeah, yeah this is so. Uh, this is a really interesting one. And so, my last company went from being a, a quite a small startup to I think it's maybe two thousand people now. So, definitely gone through this uh, process. Um, I would say that uh, not everybody is suited to one or the other or both. So, by that I mean. Um, what's the phrase wartime chief and peacetime chief, right? So uh, maybe there, there is a kind of a wartime chief element of being a startup and having to scrap and having to work seven days a week sometimes and, and fly a lot and do late evenings. And you're kind of at, you're kind of at war the whole time. And I think that when you've got a thousand staff, and you've got a succession plan and you've got a supportive leadership team or you've got 10 good product managers or whatever it may be, you can kind of close your laptop a little bit at, at, you know, at a reasonable hour. You don't necessarily have to work Saturdays and Sundays. And there's a little bit of peacetime chief about that. And the really, the really interesting thing is that as a startup goes from, from not to 60, uh, the people naturally either grow into it and, and, and come out of themselves to be a big business leaders or, mm. struggle, or, can, or can struggle being big business leaders. Um, and, and also you'll see that quite often the hiring policy has to reflect that as they go. So um, there's a, there's a probably not the ideal term to use, but there's a term grown ups for this, right? So if we're the small startup guys who started in a little room, and we're growing to 10 or 20 people and it feels like we're getting too, quite big and we need that senior leadership, the term is used sometimes that we need to hire some grown-ups, right? And, and grown-ups being people who have come from a, a, a major a major company and who, you know, um, who know how to run that, that big ship, you know? Good, yeah. So... Fantastic. So, you know, thank you so much, Connor, for all your insights. And it was a very, very precise talk. I think probably looks like, you know, just what was needed, maybe, you know, and then you know, we have to assimilate and then, you know, uh, probably have that in our mind and then stay in as a startup, even though, even though we are such a big company or whatever it is, whichever company we are looking for, right? So that's good. Thank you so much for your time. And we don't have any further questions. So probably, we will give back uh, some 15-20 minutes to our people. Yeah. Thanks, Raj. My pleasure. See you soon.